happy to announce that the Fretboard Journal now has three presenting sponsors. These are three brands that are behind us with everything that we do, including the podcasts and the videos, and they include Carter Vintage, Carter Vintage Guitars, where guitar lovers go for a good time, Gibson Guitars, only a Gibson is good enough, and last but not least, Martin Guitars. Martin Guitars and Strings remain the choice for musicians around the world for their unrivaled quality, craftsmanship, and tone can't thank these three brands enough for being presenting sponsors thank you guys hey gang welcome to the fretboard journal podcast i'm jason verlindy the founder of the fretboard journal magazine and as always that's john rauhaus playing in the background as i hope you know we are now at the tail end of our first ever fretboard journal subscription drive and what a ride it has been we have showcased some amazing videos from some of our friends, including Bill Frizzell and Molly Tuttle and Nels Klein. We have uh, had a blast connecting with all of you. We have had a ton of new subscribers join us. And if you haven't joined us yet, I would love it if you would. We are a reader-supported magazine. Advertising is a very, very small component to this equation over here. And because of that, we're able to interview whomever we want, whenever we want. We're able to be the left of the dial guitar magazine that covers all sorts of interesting characters and figures. And we're able to do things like this podcast. So go to fretboardjournal.com slash support. The cheapest and easiest way to support us is just to get a digital subscription. We also have some exclusive t-shirt packages as well as magazine, print magazine packages. And I hope you will join us for a year or two or even three Today on the podcast, I am talking to another one of my favorite people, Jay Boone, over at Emerald City Guitars. If you do not know about Emerald City, it is one of the premier vintage stores in the world. It is a store that is in my backyard. I go there once a month or so, and I sort of take it for granted that uh, I might see one or two or three or more 59 bursts there or Blackguard tellies. Jay has done an amazing job curating a store. For the last 20 plus years, he has uh, carried a wide array of electric guitars, but he tends to get the attention from uh, all these big ticket items that he gets, and uh, it is one of those rare destinations where if you look on their Instagram page, you'll see all the rock stars coming through Seattle seem to make a pilgrimage to Emerald City whenever they are in town. I wish they would come to the Fretboard Journal. Maybe some of them will after this podcast. Who knows? But uh, they always go to Emerald City, and for good reason. There's just a ton of amazing guitars there. So I wanted to talk to Jay about running a guitar store both in 2019 as well as how he got to where he is today. I don't even know what kind of a bank account you need to be able to have multiple bursts in your inventory or what kind of insurance. But uh, anyways, we had a blast talking to him. The Fretboard Journal 45 is just around the corner. It is off to the printer that I'll be mailing out in just a couple of weeks. And for anyone listening to this podcast who uh, loves electric guitars and maybe checked out our 2018 electric guitar annual we are putting one out at the tail end of this year and uh the 2019 electric guitar annual will be coming out you can pre-order it by going to fretboardjournal.com shop and it'll be right up there at the top and while you're poking around in our site i should also give a plug to our other podcast that we do the truth about vintage amps with skip simmons we are up to 21 episodes of that thing coming up on a year of doing it, and uh, I cannot thank everybody enough for checking it out, for submitting questions, for submitting photos. It is an absolute blast to do, and we have covered so much territory. I have learned so much. It's insane. Our uh, first sponsor for this week's podcast is our pals, once again, at Retrofret Vintage Guitars in Brooklyn. Retrofret has a new showroom in Carroll Gardens that you should all check out if you ever make it to New York City. And as usual, they have an insane array of guitars. They have a Slingerland Maybell Recording Master Model 12 acoustic with the green pickguard and the green bridge that is just amazing. Mother of toilet seat action. They also have a uh, bunch of Vox Phantom uh, electric guitars as well as perhaps the coolest thing I saw on their new arrivals page, a 46 Gibson J45 that is just beat to hell, but it has a fresh neck reset and looks insane. I'm sure it sounds incredible if it's been played this much. Uh, that is a guitar that will get you 
instant street credit, pretty much any bluegrass jam that you go to. Our other sponsor today is our friends over at Mono Cases. You can go to monocreators.com to see their entire line of gig bags and pedal board bags and everything else that they are doing. I am rocking the Mono Vertigo case myself with my parts caster. I absolutely love it. It is my favorite gig bag I have ever tried. It is so comfortable. It is so protective. I find myself taking my guitar out a lot more than I ever did before. I know they have a full lineup no matter what your guitar is, acoustic or electric. So go to monocreators.com and by all means, if you do order from them, tell them the Fretboard Journal sent you. And uh, without further ado, here is my conversation with Jay Boone of Emerald City Guitars, a true Seattle music institution, one of the great guitar stores in the world, and uh, a bunch of great guys. Uh, thanks for being on the Fretboard Journal Podcast. Oh, thank you, Jason. It's an honor. Man. Um, Love you guys. I can't be the only one who lives in Seattle, and I don't want to say I take for granted, but I mean, what you've built here with Emerald City, you know, you get instruments, especially some big ticket instruments that you can't find for 1,500 miles. Like, you're the only store, <laughs> sometimes on the West Coast, with, with some of the pieces that you get. And I often forget, like, oh, yeah, this is, like, basically a museum you can walk into, and it's in our backyard. And I kind of wanted to know how this started. Like, it, it, you know, you've been at this a while. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, even I always tell people it's kind of like working at the Playboy Mansion, you know, if you can say that today. But, yeah. Um, you know, we, we come in every day and we do our job and, you know, there's all this amazing inventory around us and uh uh it was a it was a pretty calculated deal to get into the super high-end market for us okay for for a couple reasons because for us after almost 25 years um you 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 can't stay complacent you gotta you're always striving to do better right every year and get your numbers up and keep it interesting and um you know the one thing i always thought about is after all these years, you see other stores open up and are people going to get tired of Emerald City Guitars because we're kind of kind of an iconic vintage guitar store, I yeah. would say, in the nation. So sometimes people re- will rebel against that, you know, for whatever reason and, and go to an alternative. Um, so I just wanted to continue to be relevant and, and and still be kind of the same store we were to a certain degree vibe wise and everything you know 25 years ago um, so that was one thing and then the other thing is just to stay in business and um, in the ever changing landscape of the vintage guitar market yeah you know it's uh, you know when I first started out I did like a three year business plan I was like wow that's so far out in the future when you know, was that? <laughs> that was 1996 okay May of ninety. May of 96. And what were you doing before? Uh, Before that, I was at a music store with a guy named Steve Davies, who was a manufacturer. He was the guy that did the Stevens Extended Cutaway on the old Nuno Bentoncourt Washburn Uh guitars, if you remember those. And we were partners for about five years. And prior to that, I was managing the the Seattle Music Store down on First Avenue. And Mm -hmm. before that, a store called Guitars Etc. Okay. So... Been in as a salesperson, a floor manager, and a manager. I was doing the music store jump around here, where mm-hmm. I five years here, five years there, five years there, and then decided that uh, I'd like to try my vision of what I kind of wanted to do. And so that's. And what was that original vision? How were you differentiating yourself from all those stores, none of which are still around? <laughs> well, Guitar Center had just moved into Seattle. Okay. And that was kind of a big deal back in, you know. 94 yeah. whenever they came in because you know you had your your bunch of stores around here all kind of independently owned shops and so it was kind of a big thing so I kind of envisioned that as okay so anybody that's going to buy a new guitar is probably going to go to Guitar Center because the sheer volume you know so I thought how about I like just a used a good used guitar store mm-hmm. for the working musicians and because there really were no internet sales back there to speak of in fact we didn't even have a website when we for a couple of years sure and even after we got a website we uh nothing was really going on there it was just like 
you yeah. know, crappy pictures we throw up and little information, but you just had to have one. So um, I decided to put together this little humble shop and deal in used instruments. I wasn't even thinking pure, like high end vintage like we are now, but just, you know, used Fenders and Gibsons and yeah. Vox Amps and Marshalls and Tyscos and Dan Electros and things like that. Sure. So. Um, that's kind of how I got it started, and it was just a quarter of the size it is now. Same area? Yeah, same building. Same building. Yeah, we've been here the whole time. You've so. ridden through a lot of changes in Seattle. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> a couple <laughs> earthquakes. I have no idea, man. Yeah. Some big ones in the last few years that have uh, kind of threatened to send a lot of uh, local business people hightailing it out of this area. Here. Yeah. But we're sticking it out, man, yeah. waiting for the beautification of the waterfront to happen, so... Yeah. We love the building. We love the area. It'd be hard to move out of here. Were you back then living near Pioneer Square, or was that just, uh, no, it just seemed like a good space? I've always lived on on the east side. When I moved here in 1980, we had kids, and yeah. we wanted to, you know. So, uh, but I also figured that if you're going to have a guitar store, you got to be downtown. Sure. You know, where, and I thought Pioneer Square was a, kind of a good area where a lot of people... Would, would come through you know yeah. a lot of walk-in stuff and then the touring musicians so yeah um, found this little space down here man on south washington street and, uh, it's it was, wild yeah do you own the building i don't oh i don't Does i sure, I sure wish i did <laughs> <laughs> well i mean initially when i moved in i was just it's a four-story building and it's a historic building it was built in 1889 it's the saint charles hotel okay so when i first moved in i just had this little you know, 1,200 square foot retail space, and they were on the street level. Yeah. And there were myself and three other spaces that were being rented at the time. There was a commercial uh, kitchen designer, there was a photographer, and a guy at a barber shop okay. at, at the end here. And so, just kind of over the years, as people left, um, I would go, hmm, maybe we'll take over that spot, mm -hmm. cut a hole in the wall, and <laughs> fill up with gear. And so, we did that three times now we have the whole uh street level yeah. story of this hotel it's amazing uh, it's full of people but um yeah they haven't wanted to sell it so. yeah <laughs> what uh i mean i don't want you giving away any trade secrets although we'd welcome them but like what were some of the things you learned over the course of those 25 years in terms of how to properly stay afloat as a, a vintage guitar business um did you did you focus more? Of, obviously, you went higher end eventually, which mm -hmm. seems to be super successful for you guys. But um, you know, what were were some mistakes made back in the day of like we're going to carry this kind of stuff and oh, it just sure. never left? Sure, sure, yeah. Um, I think in the first five years, we dabbled in new products. Like I, we were a Epiphone dealer for a while. Mm -hmm. We were a BC Rich dealer for a while. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, I had a. Um, a floor manager in here was really wanted to get into like new, more or less intermediate entry level stuff to try to draw new, which was a good idea. Yeah. Um, so that never quite panned out. Mm -hmm. uh, it just didn't fit what I, what I was comfortable with down here. People came down here kind of expected to. In those days, they expected to see quirky things. I was really into cooter casters mm -hmm. and and uh, old nationals and weird flottatone amps yep. and uh, just th the things that like if Billy Gibbons walked in he'd go yeah. okay I like this and people just go <laughs> ooh oh, things I like get you know? Billy Gibbons filter yeah yeah They're exactly not, cool uh, not, yeah. he was one of the first like superstars to walk in my door 20, 24 years ago but, okay um, I learned a lot from that guy and a couple other guys a couple local guys here yeah um, really kind of em embraced what I was doing and let me in on like cool things like you know gold foil pickups and yeah taking pickups out of old Tyscos and put them in in strats and just cool stuff that was a little yeah. different than you know what you'd normally yeah. see in a music store so the bc riches slowly yeah <laughs> got squeezed yeah. out yeah what was the um you you mentioned it like it was this uh big decision to go into the high high end stuff was there one particular instrument where you were like 
all right, we're going to have to figure out how to pay for this or... We're kind of the springboard into yeah. that. Yes, there's a great story with that, man. Uh, it's, I attribute that to like really getting us into you know, what that high-end market's about. Mm-hmm. So there was this family over in uh, eastern Washington. It was just specifically this old guy and his wife, and it turns out he had a couple brothers. But he got a hold of me, and he had a, um, a 52 Tele. Mm-hmm. that his dad bought him when he graduated from high school from um, Hoffman Music in Spokane. Okay. Been there like a hundred plus years. Okay. And um, just bonded with the guy and, and we met in Ellensburg. Mm-hmm. He brought his guitar and I'm like, wow, this is awesome. And, and I ended up buying it from him. And he goes, you know, after I got this guitar, like the next year, my, my dad and brother liked what I was doing with it so much that they went and bought two more guitars. I go, really, what'd they get? He goes, well, one's a 54 Strat and one's a 55 Hardtail Strat. Mm -hmm. Are those still around? So the 55, he's like one of the family members had and and I ended up buying that from him as well. Really great guitar. These are all original and great shape. They're church guys, so Mm -hmm. I think they only played them in the church. And then the last one, the 54, his brother had, and he was down in like Redding, California. Mm -hmm. And I kind of hounded him for about a year. Does he want to sell that? Does he want to sell that? And finally the guy became willing to sell that guitar. So we we got connected through his brother in Spokane, Mm -hmm. who who I became friends with. And uh, it's that story. The guy was a, a church guy down there too, and he played it at church. And that's kind of all he ever did. And he's an old guy now, so he hadn't played for some years. Mm-hmm. So I arranged to meet him um, down in basically uh, Roseburg, Oregon, which sure. is kind of like, I'll meet you down there. You drive up here. We met at a bank, and I asked him if I could tear this guitar apart on their on the little table there. And they're, yeah. and they're like, do you have an account here? I go, yeah, sure. Yeah, go ahead. So... <laughs> I'm sitting there with this guy, and we're here's this amazing Strat, and a really low serial number, really early, mm-hmm. like just wow, this thing's crazy. And I, I kind of talking to him, and I start taking some screws out, and just kind of questioning him, like we kind of casually interrogate people to of get course. the history, you know. Yeah. And at one point, I remember just like I don't need, I I just didn't even want to take it apart at that point. It was like I knew it was the real deal. I could smell it. I could visually yeah. see everything. I'm like. Okay, let's do it. So I ended up buying it from him and, and driving it back. And the, and when I got it back here, it was like, I knew it was like a really special first year Strat, one of the early, early ones, probably one of the first hundred made. And, mm-hmm. and um, got a guy really interested in it locally, and he brought me in like a ton of vintage gear to trade. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I ended up doing a trade with him and some cash and and... I mean, there were literally like 20 pieces, like really cool pieces. Yeah. And like the next week, people are coming in the store going, wow, what what, what happened? We had mm-hmm. like, you know, J200, some Brazilian D28s, yeah. Tilly Strats, just like, wow, it just exploded kind of. Yeah. And that that kind of set the tone for that. Yeah. That morphed into a, a whole nother deal. And then another one that's kind of interesting is the first burst we ever had was this 60 burst called Flame and Harry. And I ended up doing like a big, huge trade with that too, where we got a ton of stuff. Mm -hmm. So just kind of all of a sudden, this is working. This is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that was 15 years ago, maybe. Yeah. When it, when it, you mentioned trying to validate and authenticate that strat like are you totally self-taught on that i mean did you is that just years of tearing guitars apart yeah or yeah yeah years of tearing guitars apart have you been burned oh yeah i mean i've made mistakes yeah nothing groundbreaking but it happens once in a while Mm -hmm. and and i mean you deal with thousands of guitars over 20 plus years you miss some things too so there's had to been We've had to make restitution on a few deals over the years, too, which is never pleasant. But, I mean, the main thing in this business, Jason, really, if you're going to stay in it a long time, is you've got to totally take care of people yeah. all the time. I mean, if, if there's any question 
about your integrity or anything, man. You got to just make it so good. And, yeah. Um, it's going to happen. I mean, it happens. Yeah. You know, you day in, day out, it's life. You know, you have your ups and downs and your good days and bad days. But, yeah. you know, we've, we've missed a few things over the years that we've had to, you know, do good on. And no, you guys have a and, great reputation, which not every vintage store does. I like to think so. It's, it's getting tougher and tougher to to keep people happy and keep that reputation because of all the social media and everybody knows everything and sure. which is fine and everybody knows things that aren't even correct and mm -hmm. you know you, you get the word out on something and it just snowballs so yeah mm -hmm. it's, it's you're constantly trying to maintain that level of integrity and trust in people and yeah and the way you do it is you pretty much kind of lay down for them unless it's just blatantly one of those people that are diabolical and are mm -hmm. trying to you know that happens too I've seen yeah. it all man <laughs> yeah you have um when it i mean you mentioned a little bit about some of these trades and I, it made me just think when when these big valuable instruments come through a dumbbell amplifier or a 59 burst does anybody ever just pay cash for those or is there always some packaged trade deal to buy one People pay cash for them. They do. Yeah. All right. I mean, more often than not, that's how it goes down. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Because the clientele we're dealing with are, I mean, we're dealing with some of the most famous guys in the world that, and gals. Mm -hmm. um, I've met all my heroes, my guitar heroes down here. Well, they here. all stop here. I, I asked them to all come to the fretboard journal and they're always too busy. And then they show up on your Instagram <laughs> feed an hour yeah. later. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm humbled by that. I've got to just like, you know, put your arm around Joe Walsh or yeah. Billy Gibbons or, you know, yeah. any of these guys, and it's it's pretty cool because these are guys I grew up idolizing, you know, and yeah, and uh, so yeah, so a lot of those guys are customers, good customers, and then there's a whole pocket of major collectors, yeah, around the world that blows my mind, you know continues to blow my mind how many guys have a bunch of great stuff and yeah they continue to buy stuff and it's like wow i can't believe what this guy's got do you do you feel like it's slowing down i mean because it feels to me like there are more vintage instrument stores or there's some new ones cropping up including some that have a pretty good profile mm -hmm. um than there have been in the past i'm sure some have fallen by the wayside but do you feel like the market is slowing down or is it as strong as it was five or ten years ago God, I get asked that all the time. And, and you know, the only thing I can kind of relate to is how, how do our gross sales look every year? Yeah. And, and then, your, you know, your profit margins and all that. And then just kind of a feel. You get a feel for it, too. And um, for us, it's, it's still strong. Mm -hmm. You know, the hardest part is finding the really great stuff. I mean, the acquisition of the inventory is the biggest job. Mm-hmm. Hard to find, easy to sell if it's mm -hmm. if it's the right thing, you know. And if you can find the really great instruments, mm -hmm. which we work really hard at doing, mm -hmm. there's a market for it. I yeah, mean, I, I haven't seen it slow down. People still get really excited and really excited about the good stuff. Yeah, you know, if you can find the really great old Martin or Gibson acoustic or you know black cars and yeah, you know. Uh, custom colors I mean things like that rare amps yeah there's there's people that want them yeah you know? and I, I mean we were just talking earlier before we started here about the trip we took down to El Paso recently and we we go all over the country I mean me and Trevor will hop on a for those of you that don't know Trevor's my son and my yeah partner it's family here, business grew up here since he yeah. was seven so he's ingrained in this place as am I so we'll hop on a plane, uh, either both of us, one of us, and fly out and either drive back or buy a seat for a, you know, I flew back to Boston about a D'Angelico a few years ago mm -hmm. and to Boston and that was such a fun trip. Come back with this big old brown case next to me strapped in a seat. And what do you, what name do you mm -hmm. use when you're buying that ticket? For this, for the oh, guitar. Oh, that's a good question. My wife winds all that up. Because I mean, with the TSA, up. they, I, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, 
I don't know. Okay. She handles all that. I, I think it's just me plus an extra seat. I think she explains to him that we're flying okay. back with the guitar. Yeah. And they kind of know usually when we get on. And I, I, I fly a lot where I'll just put it in the overhead too or in yeah. the closet. Uh, but if it's a burst, if it's an old D'Angelico sure. or something crazy like that, we'll buy a seat for it, you know. Yeah. Um, and the burst market, you know, we're talking about is the market great. The burst market is a whole different beast there. That's... Uh, that's a pretty intense market, and those aren't guitars you just flip every week or something. Mm -hmm. You know, they're they're hard to negotiate to get into your shop, and then to find a buyer that's willing to lay down anywhere from two hundred to five hundred thousand dollars for a guitar. There's a handful of guys that are doing that. You know, how many have you seen? Uh, I believe that we have had around twenty five firsts wow. through our shop over yeah. the years. All great ones, or were a few in hindsight um, not as great as the others? I mean, they're all special, man. They really yeah. are. Each one is really special, but like anything else, you know, there's a rating system. And, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I don't know that I've ever had a dog <laughs> of yeah. a burst. Yeah. And it could just be me being enamored by it, but each one of these guitars are just. I'm just in awe of them, you yeah. know, what they are and, and their legacy. And I just, something about that early craftsmanship, yeah. you know, it's crazy. You, you have a business that you need to remain profitable. You've got employees. When an instrument like that, uh, someone approaches you with an instrument like a burst, mm -hmm. what goes through your head in terms of, I need to make... 10% on it or I need to make 20% or I want this just because it's great advertising for the store and eventually we'll be able to sell it. I'm sure every burst owner at this point thinks they know exactly how much it's worth. Yeah, so, yeah. so what goes through your mind and what's that negotiation even look like? I mean, all that goes through my mind, yeah. obviously. Yeah, it's good to have bursts in your store because it brings you legitimacy. Yeah. Um, we have three in here right now. Wow. You know, uh, And we're... Yeah, we might have three more if this trip works out great that we're mm -hmm. taking. Um, Do you try to always... They're, they're all individual. Yeah. You know, it kind of is. And it depends on the instrument. It depends on the person. Mm -hmm. uh, it depends on what's in your quiver as far as prospective buyers that you have in your prospect file. Yeah. Uh, it's the timing. I yeah. mean, the, the economy, the stock market. When you get into that stuff, you know, I, I follow the stock market because... Not because you have stocks. You, 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 you can <laughs> see things. I mean, real estate, stock market, vintage guitars are all like anything else. Yeah. You know, when the when the stock market's like taking a hit, um, you can see the guys kind of holding back a little bit. And mm -hmm. then when, when they some relief, you know, economic relief comes, it like opens up again. Mm -hmm. Do you I mean, feel I, like that with politics too? Like if it's a gonzo certainly. political day, certainly. things just fall flat. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. It's it's all so connected. Uh, and and over the the years here, we, we've seen a lot go on. I mean, we, the, the dot com crash sure. really changed. You know, I could totally see, see an effect in our businesses that time. All the guys we were selling stuff to during the heyday, we're all bringing it back and selling it back to us yeah. when the, the fall came. And then the recession, you know, 2007, 2008, for a few years there, totally had to change the way we did business. Mm -hmm. um, the buyers, the guys with money were still buying guitars, but they were really picky. Mm -hmm. They were picking the best. It's like, okay, I'm the, the, mar the buyer market's thinned out, so I really got a lot of choices, you know? Mm -hmm. So we kind of changed a little bit. And you don't necessarily get cheaper guitars, it's just you want the cream of the crop guitars exactly. with no issues. Yeah, if yeah. we're gonna sell them to these guys that are buying, then we gotta get find the best stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, competition is stiff on the acquisition end. I mean, all these guys that are doing what we're doing are out there hunting. You know, they got, yeah. they got their hunting license, man. And, you know, we went down to the Dallas Guitar Show here last year or this year I guess earlier in uh, you've been down you've been down there, I've been right? to it yeah. yeah I mean that's like that's such a zoo down there as far as vintage guitars it's like you can sit in a shop like this and go wow we got all this cool stuff you go down there and go there's so Here's many, where they all there's are. so many guitars <laughs> yeah. yeah we got some great stuff but yeah. 
everybody's got great stuff, you know. Do you view those shows as um, more an acquisition than... Are, do you sell many guitars at, at a show like that? Or are the guitars there mainly to kind of trade to get more guitars back into the store? In the old days, yeah, we'd go there to sell stuff. Yeah. The last 15 years, we go there to buy stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of a... I got a love-hate thing with it a little bit. I mean, I like the camaraderie and seeing all the people and seeing a bunch of cool guitars, but buying guitars at a vintage guitar show is a lot harder than having people bring, say, a vintage, say, a 56 Strat here to the shop where you can relax, put it on the bench, yep. tear it apart. You don't have 10 people going, how much you want for that? Hey, what year what yeah. is that? Hey, hey, hey. Yeah. You know, so it's, you know, it can be, it can be tough. It's like buying a house and waving the inspection. Yeah, just like, exactly. you got to decide exactly. right now. And I've been burned at guitar shows more than anywhere. Sure. We talked about that earlier. You know, yeah. When people bring stuff in here, I can take my time and uh, go through it. You know? Yeah. And, um, but yeah, when I go to a guitar show, like we go down to Dallas, we, we got uh, a list of things that our, cu our valued customers want. So we're looking, mm -hmm. you know, oh, let's find so-and-so a... Uh, 50s d28 and so and so yeah. wants a you know 57 strat and so kind of zone in and try to find things that your yeah. customers have requested you know you mentioned these uh i guess the phrase now is guitar safaris that you yeah. and trevor and have yeah. gone on over the years what do those look like are they usually based around like a collector in el paso or whatever or do you sometimes just hit the ground running in some town and try to sniff out whatever might be there. Do you always have a lead? Anymore, we do have a lead. The, yeah. the good old days, man. I mean, I, me and Trevor used to hop in the, the Jeep, man, and just drive out through Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, Oregon, just go on a 10-day camping and hitting every pawn shop. I mean, that was a lot of fun because that was a treasure hunt. Mm -hmm. Now it's much more focused. It's like yeah. we have an agenda, or, you know, an itinerary, and um, like the El Paso trip was just one of these things where this gentleman had passed away, and his widow had fifty guitars that mm -hmm. he collected over the years. He was a aspiring folk artist, and um, he died a couple of years ago. Some friends of ours, mutual friends, knew her and mm -hmm. said, "You should contact these guys. They're fair, and they'll." So I, she had a list of 50 guitars she sent me. I knew what, what I was getting going in, and there was a bunch of them that were, I wasn't really excited about getting, like a bunch of ovations and Takaminis. Yeah. Uh, so it was a bunch of ovations, a bunch of Takaminis, a bunch of guilds, and then a couple of cool old J200s and a couple of Brazilian D28s, yeah. old, some things like that. Um, but it's okay to have, you know, some cool guilds from the 70s. And, mm -hmm. and Do you just take everything in that situation? Yeah, so I figured yeah. if I could go down there and cut a deal with her that honored her and also, you know, would make sense for us. Because that's a lot to fly down and then drive 2,000 miles back with a truck full of guitars. Yeah. And it worked out great. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, that's how that one worked. Um, like this L.A. trip is more like there's eight guys down there that want us to stop by and sure you know you've got a lot of celebrities who probably yeah and, and yeah and big collectors who live down there yeah. yeah have you ever gone to a house to find out like well walter carter's gonna be here tomorrow to give me an <laughs> offer and then i've got groon coming the next day does that ever happen um that hasn't happened when we've called on somebody <laughs> okay but it happens in in the shop where Guys will bring a vintage guitar and say, well, I talked to Carter, I talked to Groon, I yeah. talked to Norm. And, yep. And then that's when it gets kind of like, you know, because a lot of people don't want to tell you what they offered them. They want you to give them an of offer. Of course. That's the first rule of garage sailing, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I just, I, I simply tell them there's an equation we use to stay in business. Yeah. And that equation can shift a little bit depending on... Um, how desirable the piece is that we're potentially buying from you. Yeah. How original it is. Um, kind of things like that. You sure. Know? And most people understand that. They, they, you know, they look around and see six people running around and an overhead. So you just kind of be, try to be honest with them. You know, yeah. the, the, the days of grandma walking in with a, you know, a 1941 D28. And, yeah. 
wanting two hundred dollars for it are, are way over. Thank God, you mm-hmm. know. Um, and it's much more calculated now, and just down to, you know, people feel comfortable with you, and and if you give them a fair offer, usually you can work something out. Yeah. You uh, you mentioned that you've got this probably one of the most valuable things in this store is this list of clients who are looking for things. Um, what are some trends you're seeing now? What, what do you wish you had 10 of in the store right now? Cause you knew you'd be, you know, you'd be able to flip them tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. So any great acoustic guitar, you know, uh, is that a stronger market than it's, it's a strong it's, market. Yeah. We sell more electrics than we do acoustics, but a couple yeah. years ago we opened up this wing. Yeah. We're kind of sitting in here and, um, really wanted to have a, an acoustic room because mm-hmm. um, we love acoustic guitars and acoustic guitars if, again if you get the great old martins and old gibsons and um, people buy them yeah you know, they don't last they don't last long at all uh, and we tr- we cover a lot of ground here so we try to have you know you, you have the old d'angelica new yorker in here you have some nice pre war Martins and some old banners and things like that. Mm-hmm. You have the old the black guards, the old tellies, broadcasters, old strats, bursts, yeah, three thirty fives, tweed amp. You know, you, we we try. We're not specifically like stay as you know Steve Swan. Mm-hmm. He's like sure. basically really great acoustic guy. Yeah, and that's what he's focused on. We're more kind of what Carter and Groon and sure. Norm are doing. You know, kind of trying to cover every base. Mm-hmm. Uh, definitely. Um, Electric guitars are sure. are the big thing, but we do really well with acoustics when we get them in. Mm-hmm. And, uh, what are some other things that uh, specific instruments that people are just chomping at the bit for? Is, is it is it black guard tellies? Yeah, They're always hot. Yeah, you know, uh, custom color strats. We just got a bunch in, sold a bunch of them. Um, Three thirty fives, pretty hot. Uh, one thing I did notice. In the last couple of years, this sunburst strats all of a sudden just kind of plateaued out, and it's a great time to buy a sunburst strat from the '50s because mm-hmm. they're very they're more affordable now than they've ever been. It's like a whole bunch of them came out of the woodworks. And what do you think that was about? Just just flooded the market, man. I don't know. It kind of bums me out because I love them, man. They're great guitars, and yeah, and we have we have a, a fair amount of them in here, but it just seems like the market got flooded with them all of a sudden, and, and people started selling them for less money and then it started kind of trending that way so you know a few years ago 58 strat you could get you know 25 26 thousand dollars for now i'm down at dallas 17 18 yeah you know and less even you know it's like wow what happened there you know yeah but then you see a lot of them out there so yeah what's the most expensive instrument emerald city has had most expensive instrument we've ever sold would Definitely be one of the bursts. I yeah. think that topped out at four hundred and ten k. Yeah, a fifty nine. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that made for a good day. You know? Yeah. Yeah. What are um, obviously in twenty five years the art of selling a vintage guitar has changed a lot. Twenty five years ago they were just used guitars, right? Yeah. Now, um, what what trends are you seeing now? What are you what are you guys working on? I know you have an incredible website now and are doing videos and yeah. demos and you have a bustling repair shop, but what are you guys working on that we may not know about? Well, our YouTube channel yeah. is something that we've uh put a lot into in the last it's almost been two years since we hired Ken Lapworth, who's an amazing videographer. Mm-hmm. He he does all that stuff for us. So I mean, 70% of our business is online. Mm-hmm. 30% is like walk-ins at the store. That's kind of an average that's been going on for a few years now. So the social media thing is huge. Mm-hmm. I mean, Instagram, you're, you know, obviously Reverb has changed the game. Of Are us. you guys on Reverb? We're on Reverb. We're, yeah. on, we're still on Gbase. Yeah. Uh, we have our, our, our own website, which is great. We attach a video to a lot of the instruments you go to see on our website because mm-hmm. we do a video every day down here um, during the week and then on Thursday we have what we call a friends pick where we'll have just guests come in and we'll hang out and they'll jam it's kind of fun you gotta know never, gets, a, never yeah. gets as many views as you That's know unless right. it's Billy Gibbons playing or something you know yeah. and, uh, so so the YouTube thing is 
is kind of something we've been hitting hard. Yeah. Um, as well as just try to keep our website strong. Uh, and that's something we really made a decision to hire this guy, Ken, a couple of years ago, hoping that it would... Well, Norm was really successful with his, too. Yeah, he it was. His, yeah. his deal. It still is. Yeah. So we kind of jumped on his bandwagon a little bit, and, and it's it's worked out really great. Mm -hmm. uh, getting a lot of good responses from that. and They sell instruments, too. You know, you always talk to a guy, a lot of phone conversations, so we try to source where they're getting their info from. So a lot of people are tuned into that YouTube deal and, and Instagram is pretty big too. Yeah. Yeah. So for us, as far as like, well, what, what do we got brewing for the next few years? Uh, to be really honest with you, I'm looking at all the young people I have working down here now and trying to get them set up mm -hmm. for the next 10 years you know because mm -hmm. i've been here a long time man so i'm not going to be here forever yeah on, on a regular full-time basis so um it's in great hands with trevor and yeah. talked about the repair department um so uh, you know eric was my guy for yeah, eric years does. yeah 15 years down here yeah. we love eric Daw. he's an amazing guy and i i used to lose a little bit of sleep thinking of what it would be like without eric because yeah. i knew one day he would go on to better things yeah or, or not you know different things yeah it's a hard and place seattle's a hard place to live yeah isn't it? Live yeah and eric's a small town boy like me so um it was inevitable that he, his time would 15 years man that's like yeah a long time <laughs> yeah uh i was fortunate enough after uh about a year of kind of dabbling with a few different repair people uh i landed uh tyler geske mm -hmm. who uh Arizona guy uh, went to Arizona University and studied engineering then went to Roberto Van and got his degree there I always call him my first round draft pick you know <laughs> and he's been with us almost three years now and he's amazing he, yeah. he's he's so bright he's he reminds me a lot of Eric when I first hired Eric when Eric was like 25 mm -hmm. or 26 and he's just a sponge man and uh, he's He's becoming quite an expert, not only on vintage guitars, but pickup building and Martin guitars. Yeah. And he's actually studying under Mark Tossman now, if that's oh, cool. a name you know. Yeah. Because Mark, like me, is getting a little bit older. And, yeah. And Mark's such a great guy, man. He recognizes that he has all this information and talent. He wants to pass it on to somebody, which is so admirable. You yeah. Know? And, and so... Tyler being the bright kid Gets that he on the is. Ferry is going, and yeah, goes yeah, and he's going over this notes. weekend. Yeah, which I think is great. And so the repair department is in great hands with him. I'm really so glad that I found somebody to replace Eric you know, yeah. without taking a big dip there. Yeah. You know, that was huge. So yeah, um, all, all the the cats down here, these young guys, they're they're into it, man, and they're smart and they're yeah. you know. Like I said, Trevor's, it's been ingrained in him for years. He's been running around this shop as long as I have. And he knows exactly how to ride that merry-go-round, mm -hmm. you know. You've got some amazing young employees. Do you feel like there are amazing young customers still into vintage guitars or, or getting to be? I know, like, the pedal world is huge right now, and a, a lot of younger players gravitate towards that and maybe yeah. have one or two guitars but are you finding people starting to get into asking questions about you know old fenders and gibsons and everything yeah yeah i yeah. do um so the, the you mentioned the pedals pedals yeah. pedals are like we have some pedals but for us and not not anything against them i mean believe me it's a huge market yeah but I, I literally don't have time to mess with pedals. No, it's, it's a hard. really crazy vintage kind of thing. It but, is, yeah. Because it's a whole another world that sure. you get consumed with, and mm -hmm. and so we do. We put our best foot forward, what we do best, and yeah. that's you know the instruments and the, and the amps and stuff like that. Um. So yeah, the the pedal thing is interesting. Um, Kind of lost my train of thought there for a second. No, no, no. I was just what wondering was, about younger. You oh, know, younger like, people, I, right? You know, the, yeah, that's a great question. Because our guitar I, collectors aging out of this, or yeah, not. yeah. And we get that. We get asked that all the time. Like, yeah. what's going to happen when your generation? Yeah. 
well, what's going to happen is there's going to be a lot of guitars on the market because, you know, these guys are going to pass away and their widows are going to be, sure. you know, so, or get old enough to where they figure it's time to cash in their chips. So they're, mm-hmm. uh, I'm guessing in the next, you know, 10 years, 20 years, certainly, which will go by very fast, um, there's going to be a, some amazing stuff come out of the woodworks. Sure. And are there going to be enough young, interested guitar players to where you know there's still going to be a strong market um you know there we we get a lot of young cats in here and it's always great to see young people that are like really into the vintage stuff you know it's nothing cooler than having a dad bring his 13 year old kid in and he knows what a, a <laughs> stuff about old strats and sure and we like put a twenty thousand dollar strat mm-hmm. in his hands like go ahead and play kid you know and yeah that's really a a lasting impression so it's kind of up to us to help them carry that torch as well so i think having the younger folks down here who are really excited about this stuff kind of will translate into those people and hopefully it'll keep the market you know strong but i don't know man you have to think it might dip a little bit at some point mm-hmm. but uh you know every year there's less and less vintage guitars too because you lose a few and floods and fires and yeah thefts and so uh hopefully it'll all kind of work out Kind yeah, of people, nice, you, know? you know, people don't seem to make that argument uh, as much, you know, I like, I hate to, I don't want to be the gross guitar aficionado that guy, but like, you know, in watches and in cars, like those markets are still really strong and mm-hmm. maybe in the watch market, it's kind of stronger than ever. Yeah. And so um, I don't know why it wouldn't translate to guitars that young people, as they start to get income and settle down, yeah. wouldn't want to invest in musical instruments but. they're so ingrained in our history and our, our yeah. lives too you know and uh i don't know i i've always been enamored by guitars since i was a little kid just they looked cool they you know mm-hmm. they meant you were cool if you had one and totally you know they're like this this great art that you can interact with mm-hmm. you know it's amazing so what would you do uh what's your retirement plan what do you want to do yeah so i've got a I got a bunch of guitars stashed at my house. Nothing crazy. Like, I don't own a burst in my collection. Mm-hmm. Um, but kind of my, my, my ideal vision is to be kind of a consultant down here for these guys. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, just because I love being in the game. And then going out to some vintage guitar shows with some of my guitars that I've collected over the years and just kind of having low-key fun with it and, really? and being out in the field i, I you love can't the, escape it i love the hunt man <laughs> i love the treasure hunt i mean i should be the american pickers or yeah. one of those guys you know that that's who i am i love digging through stuff and and going to people's homes and having them tell me the stories about their grandpa's guitar and yeah and especially when they have oh and, and he's got all this stuff in here too and they open a closet like Whoa! you know a little tape machine and a little da, 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 da. I mean that's to me that's the funnest thing that's the video series you guys need to do I know man yeah. there's so many so many things we could do like that um, so there's that part of it and then another really like fulfilling part is to go from there and then find that guy that loves and you get to tell him the story and this guy's so excited to get that guitar man mm-hmm. that's what makes this deal beyond you know making a living or anything nobody nobody we're not getting rich doing this we're we're just making a living, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, but I'm, we're really passionate about that too, which makes the job so much easier. But, you know, going from that phase to actually getting in the hands of somebody that's really excited about it is so cool. Yeah, you know, nice. It's you're not a, you're not retiring at all. It sounds like. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, I, I love what I do, and you know, it to, just to be able to kind of like do it on your own terms, I mm-hmm. guess, you know. I, I still like coming down here, um, but there are some times when it's, I mean it's it's it can get crazy down here. I mean you know you've been down yeah. here like people running around and sure you know you'll go from talking to a guy about a burst or buying a blackguard from a guy and then turn around some guys like complaining about a, a string he just bought or something that broke on his <laughs> funky old street guitar and you're trying to explain to him that well your bridge. Mm-hmm. is a nail you know mm-hmm. <laughs> so uh that part of it you do get yeah. it all here yeah that's for sure. yeah you know 
this this whole area down here is definitely colorful and can be challenging. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what's your what's your go to guitar at home? I know you still gig even once in a while, right? I do gig once yeah. in a while, and primarily when I gig anymore, I'm playing bass. Okay. So I've got a, a 67 P bass. That's kind of my my go to bass. I've got a bunch of cool basses like an old uh, black 4001 I've got a couple old Hofners some old Silvertone basses crazy stuff but I, I gotta admit like my go to guitar mm-hmm. acoustic guitar is a 1947 Southern Jumbo nice. it's just got it going on man yeah and that's a guitar I've had for a long time mm-hmm. wrote a lot of songs on that guitar my electric guitar my go to guitar is uh, an Eric Daw creation. It's a pinup. Mm-hmm. It's one of his uh, Telecaster style guitars. That I, I own five of his guitars, and I, I just love them, man. They're just, you know, yeah, yeah. Go to guitars. They they feel vintage. You know, they got a great sound and feel to them. And I, I like that my buddy Eric built them for me. You yeah. Know? And um, you've had a few luthiers who built. Come through here, right? Didn't Eric yeah. Danheim work here? Yeah, Eric Danheim. Yeah, yeah Big Tex. The late great Rest in peace. Yeah. yeah, Danheim was amazing. I love that guy. Um, and we carry a few local Northwest guitars too. Mm-hmm. So uh, I don't do a lot of new instruments, yeah. but we do uh, the pinup guitars. Yeah. And we do Joe Reggio, mm-hmm. his Reggio guitars, which are awesome. Um, we do the Walla Walla guitars. Yeah, which I, I don't think I would have known about had it not Dude, been they're, for they're here. Dude, they're so cool. Yeah. They're really trippy. Um, you know, they use, uh, on some of them, they use vintage distressed wood, like old crates yeah. and stuff, which I think they kind of got the idea from this guy, Kurt Shane. That yeah, was doing... who was also, wasn't he also in Walla Walla? Or was he in Tri-City? Was he, he was in, in some Walla... other, yeah, he was Yakima. Maybe it was Tri-City. Yeah. Yeah. And we sold a few of his guitars. They were amazing. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're they're super cool guitars and high quality. Um, and then we're doing uh, this guy Adam Hansen makes these guitars called Patriarch guitars, and he's an amazing guy too. He uh, he'll do everything from an, an acoustic flat top to a, a arch top to a Telecaster. Okay. You know, and uh, we just like the guy. We like his work. So it's kind of cool to feature some unique guitars that are have Northwest roots. In yeah, there. it's kind of fun. You've built quite an empire. Okay? Yeah, it's, been yeah it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool how it's kind of grown organically, and uh, yeah, it's 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 been a good run, man. We hope it continues. It's yeah, a lot of fun, man. Cool.